Now, we've got some time uh, for questions, and uh, I'm, I'm conscious, uh, Minister, would you mind taking a couple of questions? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you can just unmute yourself. Sorry there, I was just reading the, some of the questions there. I, I, I'm yeah. multi well, multitasking at the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, I can, I can take some of them. Yeah, probably, I mean... Well, I'll tell you what, maybe if, if I just even sort of summarise, um, you know, a, a couple of them, and again, sorry for putting you on the, on the spot like this, no but obviously the, the direct provision issue has come up in the context of COVID and suitability for kids. So maybe that's one thing you, you'd want to address. And then two other questions that have come across my screen, I'm not sure if, if they're on your screen, but again, let me just summarize. Uh, somebody has raised the issue about student supports uh, for some categories of, of migrants. And I guess there, there's a suggestion, there's a, a disconnect uh, that some categories of migrants are not able to apply uh, for student supports. Um, so a, a, a view and a reaction to that. And then there was a, a third question about potential collaboration between your department and the Department of Sport in terms of, you know, that I think it's a familiar argument and a good argument that one of the greatest integrating uh, tools in Ireland and elsewhere is actually sport. Uh, so direct provision, student supports and sport. So if you, if you want to just address them and whatever else, yeah. and whatever makes you wish. Yeah, we, we could actually um, be talking for a long time about the direct revision system. And again, I, this report isn't on that, obviously. Um, it is a hugely um, um, contentious issue. We have made an awful lot of improvements on there. We have quite a lot of people now who have owned our accommodation. Um, but again, uh, um, anytime we, we have a direct revision centre opening in an area, we have problems. People have said we've got, we've got to get rid of it. We've got to abolish it. There's a big campaign at the moment on that. Um, I, I mean, I, I, ideally, you could have everybody arriving into Ireland and be in, get get a, an apartment or a house or whatever straight away. That can't happen. Um, the the imperative is to ensure that people have a place to stay, that they are have, have, have food, that they have um, heat and protection and other services as well, other supports. That's what the DP provides. Um, we're, we're, we have had the, uh, quite a number of reports. We have further reports. Now we have Catherine Day working at the moment on looking at how best we can improve the, the, the system further. Um, is there another way of doing it? We are very anxious to improve and we have been working very hard to do that. Uh, and we will continue to do so. Uh, when we're open for any ideas or suggestions and the NGO community in other countries um, step up to the mark and um, you know, get involved in this. And we've been, I've invited to anyone who has, who wants to actually roll up their sleeves and get involved with us, come forward with proposals and, and suggestions. Um, that's one. Student supports, again, the Department of Education, the, the whole issue of uh, the migrant integration strategy and other strategies is they're a whole of government approach. Um, the, the Department of Education are involved there uh, and also the Ombudsman for Children. But I would be quite anxious that, um, that young people would actually get the, um, an opportunity to reach their full potential, whatever that would be. I agree with you fully on the importance of sport. Sport is hugely important. And I've attended a number of areas where I have seen migrants and uh, people from different backgrounds playing together, uh, either in GA, the, 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 they've done a lot of work in that area, soccer has done a lot of work, uh, rugby, athletics, and so on. Uh, I've attended the Athlon IT events uh, every year, which, which are amazing when you see them. And I would, I, I'm, I'm confident that in the next number of years, we will see people from migrant back, backgrounds and, and second and third generation uh, Irish people from you know, coming home with um, medals from Olympics and international events. And, 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 and we, we, we'll be very proud of them and we are when they do that. So again, I, there are challenges in all these areas. I mean, this is what this report is about, to identify what the challenges are so that we know from a science point of view, what we need to do. Um, and, and I'm always very cautious of anecdotal evidence and you know, emotion taking over. All of this has to be science-based and, and that's where the ESRI does such a marvelous work and valuable work and that's why we fund the work for, to get an independent analysis, scientific, objective, so we can then move forward when we have the, idea, when we have the evidence. Great. Thanks for that. I said I, I know you were here to answer questions, but those when I saw them there, uh, I, I, I thought would appreciate it. Um, okay, so to, to broaden it a little bit, uh, an interesting question uh, has come in, and it's about the role of employers. Okay, in in the context of the sort of labour market disadvantage uh, that we're talking about. So I might um, 
go to you first, Fran, on this, and then maybe to you, Thomas, uh, after that, from an international perspective. But I suppose, um, if, you know, is there a role for employers or, you know, is, is there a sense that the sort of report is, is making recommendations for government uh, rather than, than employers? So your, your response? Hi, Alan, thanks. So in terms of, um, in terms of employers, I suppose one issue is the, the issue identified about, uh, about discrimination and, and also that Salome raised about equal treatment and equal opportunities for, employ, uh, for, 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 for all and for all ethnic groups. So it's just that employers are aware, they know what, uh, what counts as discrimination and, and often uh, they, they, they may not be aware of it but, it, but it is important that in their HR policies or in their, uh, in their hiring and promotions and everything that they're um, that they're not even unconsciously uh, discriminating against people on on the basis of their origin. In terms of um, a further training, this will will be of of, of impact or it'll be beneficial for all employees. Um, English language training, I suppose, in the report we suggest that maybe this is more of a um, uh, that, that the state should be providing. Um, obviously, um, it could only be a benefit to, uh, um, to, 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 to employees if, if, if their employer is providing uh, that. But um, I think, you know, maybe I, I can see that some migrants and, and, and indeed um, some people throughout Ireland have problems with internet access, but Maybe one learning from this crisis is that that language learning could could happen online in terms of 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 access and also just being easier so people don't have to go after work they don't have to travel somewhere if they live in a rural area they can they can engage online so that might be a switch it happens in some other countries that would be worth considering okay thanks for that and Thomas, can you give us a sort of an international perspective? Are there some countries where employers are more to the fore in these sort of immigrant uh, integration processes? Yes, there's been a huge uh, mobilization actually of um, of um, all kinds of stakeholders and employers in particular in the last couple of years following the large inflow of refugees and it's been often those countries where the inflow was particularly pronounced where we've seen the strongest employer initiatives. Um, like in Sweden, uh, uh, Germany uh, in, in particular. Um, there's, when you look at the issue of employers, and, and I, I, I really think there has been a, a regained interest in, in, in their role in integration in the, in the last couple of years, um, I think there's, there's two dimensions. One that, the, as also Fran mentioned, uh, there's clearly the, the non-discrimination uh, issue, which is, uh, which is like the the base start, that's like the bare minimum, <laughs> let's put it that way, um, um, that you make sure that your HR practices are, um, uh, are not discriminatory. Um, but obviously, there's also sort of an institutional discrimination or institutional disadvantage by the way how employers are hiring and reach out to, to, to different groups. I mean, like if you, if you post, if you, um, uh, depending on how you fill your vacancies, um, migrants can be at a structural disadvantage, um, particularly when you consider that most, um, most vacancies are filled through some kind of informal contact, uh, even when it's formally published somewhere, but there's quite often somebody who gives you a helping hand and says, why don't you look at that website? Why don't you look for that company? And migrants have much less of these, of these networks. So here mentorship programs can help and employers can uh, actively uh, contribute also that their staff uh, participates in those. And also to have a broader reflection about recruitment channels. Um, um, in some cases actually in, uh, in the Belgian region of Flanders, we have even seen websites uh, come up where employers said, okay, I want to make uh, it sure that disadvantaged uh, uh, migrant, but also other community groups uh, uh, which are particularly disadvantaged have a chance to apply first. So they, they first post those vacancies for a couple of weeks when they have some time on those specific websites and then they open it up more broadly. Um, uh, and to give the, these people a, a bit of an a, additional advantage. Um, so yes, I think the, the role of employers in the whole process of integration uh, can actually not be overestimated. Okay, thanks for that. Another question I'm looking at here, and it actually kind of draws out the, the theme further, and it, it's about this sort of notion that 
um, the, the evidence that migrants who are more closely connected with native people uh, tend to do better. Okay, and the way the questioner has, has put this is that, uh, you know, it, it, you learn an awful lot about the, how a society works by engagement with people in, in that society. And I think we know this uh, from the sort of history of migration research, that sometimes migrants can almost become trapped in their own networks, okay? That if, if, if there's too big a network and too big a group, they, they can become excluded uh, from the sort of the native population and, the, and there's a difficulty there. So the, the questioner is, is asking, has anybody been able to look at the extent to which immigrants have native networks, if I can put it like that, and to the extent to which those uh, are, are important. So again, let me, I'll, I'll go to the ESRI team and I'll go to Salome uh, on that one as well, uh, if I might. So I don't know, Fran, Shannon or Ivan, do any of you want to talk about that? issue of uh, immigrants and their connectedness into native networks. Somebody put up a hand and I'll go to them. You're going to take it, Fran? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, um, Alan. Yes. Um, so we haven't, we didn't look at it specifically in this report, but it's a very good idea, actually, because we do have housing and other members of the family. So we could actually look with who people are living with. And um, I suppose in terms of actually uh, living with people as, as a sort of uh, close contact, um, um, intermarriage has, has been looked at and uh, you know uh, some, some findings from previous research in Ireland are that uh, say West Europeans are more likely to be married to Irish people than some other groups. I'm not sure whether that's uh, um, you know, how that would look uh, how that would look now but as I say this is something uh, we, we also find in other research looking at attitudes of the of the Irish born population that those who had more contact tended to have more positive attitudes. So I think in terms of both migrants learning the rules of the game, so to speak, in terms of how Irish society works, how the labour market works, uh, having, having Irish networks, of course, having language helps making friends and having those kind of social networks, but uh, that, that, uh, that's definitely something we should, we should look at further. Okay, and Salome, would you like to comment on that question at all? This this issue of the the importance of immigrants having networks amongst the the the, the, the native Irish population. Yeah, I think it's actually very important. Then uh, we've seen that working, for example, in Mon where um, you know the whole in the whole area of language, and this is actually with the program refugees on where they start like conversation classes. They also actually help them to uh, make art craft, which they help them also to, to look for markets for selling. So having connections with those networks or uh, native networks is very, very important. On, again, on our Women, Peace and Security, which I, I, I actually co-chaired last year, it became very clear that, you know, migrants cannot just integrate on themselves. For example, migrant women have to bring my indigenous women into, into to their networking and to, into their discussions. So I think it's very important. But in terms of labor markets, th those who have connections with the natives also give them reference letters. Remember some of the employers are asking people uh, to give uh, reference letters, even for houses now. So if you do not have any connections or you don't link to any network, and I mean some of the native networks, I know, you know, people like Ken McHugh who are in this have uh, supported people quite a lot because people link with his network as well. And others that, that I may not name who are in this, um, in this meeting. So it's very important that also migrants link into those networks which are already existing because they help in making recommendations. They also help maybe in telling where the jobs are. But really, like I have said, the shift needs to change on how Irish people think, and in particular indigenous towards migrants, and in particular on the stereotypes on discrimination. We really need to work on that. Okay, thanks for that. Um, a very direct question, Fran, which I'm going to give to you. Um, so it's this question, but the longer time people live in a country, and I think this was from Thomas's presentation, that the longer time people are, are in the country, the, the better the employment uh, situation tends to be. Uh, but the person is asking, it, it seemed to show that uh, unemployment of migrants uh, for lower than 10 to 20 years was increasing. Anyway, there seems to be a different picture there between what we were finding from the OECD and what we were getting from the ESRI in terms of sort of the, the relationship between duration and your labour market outcomes. Is that something you can answer quickly or will we have to dig back on that one? And just don't, you need to unmute yourself, Fran. 
No, you're still uh, unmuted. Sorry, sorry, Alan. Uh, typically, in terms of uh, the what we found on the unemployment uh, findings were that people who had been in Ireland sort of 10 to 20 years were doing better than those who had arrived more recently. People who'd been there much longer, and there aren't many of them, uh, didn't find such a advantage in terms of unemployment. We also found a slightly uh, Conf not confusing, but counterintuitive finding about the kind of jobs that uh, migrants had. So those in the high skilled jobs, that was to do with, um, that part of that is then people who come uh, on, on work permits, for example, they're already matched to quite a high skilled job uh, because they wouldn't be allowed to come to work uh, without that. So we think that may be part of why uh, the ones who have uh, some recent arrivals are actually uh, quite well in terms of jobs. Okay, thanks for that. Now we're coming towards the the, the end, and uh, any time I share these, I'm always sort of made aware that it's uh, it's not easy to stay focused on a Zoom call for too long. Uh, but we're going to end with a bit of a killer question, okay? And uh, somebody put it very very succinctly, which is the fundamental problem is discrimination, okay? And the argument here is is that if we don't solve discrimination, nothing else is going to matter. Okay, now that's a rather big one to end on. So uh, I, I'm looking across the panel. Would anybody like to volunteer an answer to that? Would you, you as lead author, Fran, and it's it's your day. So uh, maybe if you'd like to conclude on that one. Yes, I mean, our findings uh, do suggest that uh, discrimination does matter. Uh, the findings about the black ethnic group uh, are, are very clear on that. The report, does show that other things matter too. Uh, English language ability matters, education matters, um, you know, so, so discrimination is playing a role. If discrimination is not addressed, you know, even with the language and the education, disadvantages for, say, the black ethnic group may still exist. But I think it, it is also important to bear in mind that you know, uh, qualifications recognition, recognition, matching people to jobs um, is, is, um, is, is also important. Okay, thanks, thanks for that. Um, okay, well with that I, I should probably draw things to a close. So uh, I want to thank uh, Fran on the team for uh, producing a great report and presenting it so well. Um, obviously, our sort of the level of interaction is a bit lower on a, on a Zoom call, uh, but nevertheless, people should feel free to uh, email questions into Fran and the authors, and we can sort of keep a, a dialogue going in uh, in very uh, different ways. So, I want to talk. Uh, thanks, Salome and Thomas, for joining us and for sort of reflecting on the report and giving sort of you know very well thought out comments. Really appreciated them. Uh, I want to thank Minister Stanton for for joining us and again sort of making remarks uh, that had had real meaning. Um, so I know it's a, it's a slightly uncertain time for you, uh, Minister Stanton, I know uh, lots of change potentially in your life, but can we just uh, re-emphasize that we've, we've often done, uh, in the unfortunate event uh, that, that you were to, to move on from the department, we would sincerely miss you because you've been a great supporter uh, of not just the SRI research, but you've always engaged with the research and made that point about using research uh, to contribute to the policy debate. And every time you've been with us, you've always made that point. And needless to say, as researchers, we appreciate ministers with that perspective. So uh, sincere thanks to you. And, and can I, can I, Alan, thank you and everyone who took the time to get involved in this this morning. This will be important for the Anti-Racism Committee and the integration strategy going into the future and any new integration strategy, because this is really important research. And, and uh, what Salome said there about EPIC and everything else that Salome said is, is true as well. There's a, if we all work together here in a positive way, we can make a massive difference. It's very easy to throw brick bricks and criticize and complain and moan, but we really have to roll the sleeves up and get to work, get the evidence, get the research. You've done that. Thank you for it. I'm not sure where I'm going to be in a few weeks' time, but I hope to be in a position to keep an eye on stuff anyway. Thank you. Very good. Anyway, well, listen, with that, I just uh, thank everybody who joined in today, and uh, hopefully, we'll see you virtually or in person before too long. So, thanks very much. Goodbye, everyone.